Carol, in studying communication between uh, uh, creatures, which is a major category of biology, uh, I, I want to apply the way of thinking that you've approached this, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence in terms of language communication. Uh, what can you, what can we learn from the way you think about extraterrestrial communications potentially to understand the philosophy of communications as they actually occur among biological creatures? That's a really interesting question. I think if we look at biological creatures on Earth, we have much more evidence that there are more complex, maybe even linguistic communication systems than are widely recognized because, again, we anticipate that it's not legitimate and uh, language unless it's like our language, which is linear and uh, acoustic. But if you look at dolphins, for example, there's evidence that they communicate quite sophisticated uh, things to each other uh, that have modified their behavior acoustically and a way through water in a way in which we don't communicate. And there is uh, definitely interesting cases. For example, prairie dogs, it's claimed, and I've heard people say, oh no, that work wasn't any good. But it's kind of worth pursuing. I'm not so sure that the work isn't any good so much as we just refuse to acknowledge that that particular form of communication is language. So prairie dogs apparently communicate with each other in a kind of linguistic structure. They're able to identify various kinds of predators. They're able to uh, identify new predators such as uh, black fox put together uh, these whistles and sounds they make. Uh, the most interesting case is actually the cuttlefish, because mm. cuttlefish communicate, it took people a long time to discover this, uh, with their skin. So we have a two-dimensional color scheme which cuttlefish use. They have very sophisticated chromatophores which can actually um, switch. Not only do they reflect light, but they can turn the reflectivity on and off in various intriguing ways. And so patterns of light ripple over the cuttlefish three-dimensionally, uh, not three-dimensionally, but two-dimensionally over the cuttlefish, and the cuttlefish can communicate with this two-dimensional pattern to fellow cuttlefish about threats, about uh, you know kinship, about all food mm. sources, etc. And they can also do this by rendering themselves invisible to other cuttlefish. But it's a two-dimensional language, and I don't think we, with our expectation that all languages is kind of acoustic linear structure that's uh, you know has syntax of the sort we do are capable really of recognizing a two-dimensional uh, language that's a matter of uh, color patterns so I think that in terms of communication the behavior of the animals in response to and and certainly big data can help us with this in response to these various changes in skin coloration, for example, uh, can give us hints that they are communicating very sophisticated things. And people are beginning to do that, but I always find it amusing that despite the preponderance of evidence, there's always people who say, no, no, that's not really language mm -hmm. because it's not like ours. How many different um, uh, signs or characteristics can cuttlefish, as your example, communicate? What, what, what's the, 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 the rough number that's estimated? I, I don't know the answer to that, but it's large. large. Uh, it's large, yes. And it's very sophisticated, and, su and they're able to communicate. They're able to make, render themselves visible to predators while still communicating with each other, which is really astonishing. They're invisible. To invisible. Yes, they render themselves by changing their skin so they're not really visible to, to predators. predators. But they can still communicate to each other. Oh. It's, uh, it has to do with, they have this incredibly sophisticated skin with chromatophores and they're able to actually turn their chromatophores in different uh, hmm. angles. Hmm. So it's fascinating. But that, that's an example I think that astrobiologists ought to study in much greater detail yeah. because it seems to, they do, res they have recorded that they respond to different patterns in a variety of different ways and you can c correlate them with the patterns. Why I like what you just said is that this shows the importance of what a philosopher of biology can do. The biologist is going to discern the, how the, the, the different colors work in the different skin orientation. And, but, but what you're saying, taking your inferring from that and now showing how it can be used potentially 
to uh, discern extraterrestrial life. Yes, I think that and, in and, terms of... And a of, biologist normally wouldn't do that. Then right. that's what, so at least we have job security for a philosopher. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that scientists are beginning to do that, but a, what a philosopher can do, and you have uh, a philosopher of language, for example, can do is suggest these alternative possibilities because they're an outsider looking in and they're not embedded in these assumptions that are made by somebody who's down and dirty in the field.